I tell you what, there's nothing like crazy worship. Um, yeah, God is good. God is real good. He's done it again. Oh, thank you, Lord. Father God, we pray that you be exalted on today. That your word is the word that we hear, that you would prepare our, our spiritual ears, our spiritual heart now, till it good. Pray that the praise and worship tilled it really well. Because your word says that that's what the praise is. That the praise breaks up the follow ground and prepares us to receive. Oh Lord, so now we pray that you speak. That we might receive the word of life. That we might receive of your truth. Regardless of how it makes us feel. Regardless of what we think about it. Help us to receive it. And help that fruit of that seed to bring forth fruit in its time and in its season that's appointed for it. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Let your word, God, be that seed. Help us that we don't plant the unprofitable tares of this world. That we aren't choked by the distractions. That the evil one doesn't come and pluck away the word. That riches and our desire for comfort and our desire to have a life that we consider normal supersede our desire to have a life that is sealed, signed, and stamped with your name on it. Oh God, help us to be that peculiar people in the midst of a perverse and dark world that parades itself around as light. So Lord, we pray that you would uh, just prepare us to receive of you today. That you would forgive us of every time we felt short. And that you would cleanse us by the renewing of the word that we might get it over and over again in a way that we might grow and change the way we act. Above all, Lord, we pray that your will is done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Made to be healed. Made to be healed for the purpose of being healed. That was a line in the song God gave me on yesterday that line stuck with me and when I was going over the song in the Ebenezer that he gave me to help remember the song when I read that line again he said that's that's what you're talking about on tomorrow so this is not just a feel good milk message but this is also an example of what the experiential walk with God looks like as that Ebenezer stone is uh, kind of established in your life and you can get to a new place of hearing because you have built with the faith of the last word and it's gone through the test and now it's tempered and it's ready and it's it's done the manifested thing that it's supposed to do and God yet speaks again to bring you to that next place to that next Ebenezer stone. Uh, that's a practical example. I like to preach practicality. I like to preach how to practically apply the Bible. And it seems sometimes that, you know, I'm getting super deep and super spiritual, especially in the higher levels. But that's because we need to understand that God's mind is infinitely higher than ours. And even to understand that which he created in the context of the Bible requires us to think beyond the scope of Jesus loves me, this I know. Beyond the scope of grace, 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 grace. Beyond the scope of mercy, 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 mercy. Beyond the scope of God gave me a good life. I don't smoke crack no more. So thank Jesus, I'm just saved. I'm so glad Jesus rescued me. No deep calleth unto deep is what the Bible says. So I try to preach from a perspective that pushes you in that direction and that's not a popular way to preach because it's constantly designed to put you in a place of being uncomfortable and that is antithetical with today's church that is designed to give you comfort when the world seems uncomfortable designed to give you answers when the world is you know all around you doing all of this confusion but the church's actual purpose is not to give you comfort, but put you in a place of uncomfortableness that you forsake yourself. 
such that you hang your head down and say, nothing that I have down here is good. I need to be more like Christ. And that, that has to come from a place of being pushed into an uncomfortable position. And that has nothing to do with whether or not someone loves you or not. Truthfully, if they do love you, then they'll put you in that place so that you can have these real conversations with what, what needs to be needs to happen. Well, it's kind of too late for that now. We're at the, now you're either ready to jump or you're not. We're at that point, unfortunately. So reconciliation and all that, even if it happens, there's no changing what's about. It's going to happen. Don't want to get off topic. Made to be healed. I like it when God gives me milk messages that fall in harmony with the itchy-eared Christianity of this dispensation. This, that type of Christianity that I just explained to you. Not because it makes me seem less radical or out there or crazy or he just preaches condemnation as a preacher, but because messages like these have the greatest chance of being heard, received, and properly responded to. That's important. Not just being heard, not just being heard and received, heard, received, and properly responded to, properly responded to. The, the bearing of the fruit that yields forth to more fruit, that the Father can come and pluck and come back later and see more fruit. The proper response. That's sad that messages like these are the only ones that have such a great chance of being properly responded to. But soldiers, like I've said before, soldiers don't get to pick their battles. They don't get to pick their war or the fights that they fight in the wars and the battles. They only get to fight and follow orders. So I hope this message hits every devil hindering the maturity of the children of God square in the teeth. With that being said, I hope it knocks him all down his throat. I got another line from another song that I won't mention today that talks about that spiritually happening in detail, but that's neither here nor there. Made to be healed. Made to be healed. That's what I want you to be thinking about today as you turn to John chapter 9. Made to be healed. You know, the account of the potter in Jeremiah 18 is not just about yielding to the potter's hands. That's so often what we focus on. But it is just as much about accepting the destiny tied to what you see as imperfections. It's also about accepting the destiny tied to what you see as imperfections. I don't want to get too deep, but the Bible says that before the potter molds the clay into what seemed good to him, first the clay was marred in his hands. It was deformed, messed up, not functioning properly, perverted, changed. And that condition was the impetus that caused the potter to take that lumpy, dirty, messed up clay. He didn't go over to his, his rack of finished cups and grab that if you've ever been to a pottery place. They, they, the wheel isn't the only thing in the room. They have a whole stack of whatever they're making because they don't usually just make one if they're a professional potter. He didn't go over to the formed cups and grab that and start shaping that as it seemed best to him. He took that lumpy, messed up stuff and the imperfection was what caused or, or, or qualified, that's a better word, that's what qualified the particular clay that he was working with to be worked on and to be shaped into its destiny, uh, its final destination. He didn't get something finished and he didn't get something unprepared because you can't just take the clay and put it on the wheel. You have to prepare the clay. If you watch the potter, he doesn't just take any old clay. It's been soaking. He takes more water. And I won't go down that rabbit hole. I don't want to get too deep into that. It's a whole nother sermon. Uh, are we at John chapter 9? Okay, the word of God reads like this. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. That the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, preachers done told this whole scripture up, so I'm not going to go all down all the different avenues and its connection to some of the previous activities. I want to stay right on the point of today's topic, made to be healed. And in that vein, the Bible starts out by declaring to us that the subject of Jesus's next miracle was a man, a man. Anthropos, and by the context of the word and the cultural context in which Jesus was traveling through, we can conclude that this is probably a man that's at least 30 years old. 30 years old. That's, that's 30 years of affliction that he didn't do nothing to deserve and let people know that it was from birth. He's been afflicted like this. 30 years of a handicap that he didn't create, his parents didn't create, it's not his fault. 30 years and the text indicates that anyone in the world could have been that guy. We all universally qualify for it because he wasn't the reason for it in the first place. The Bible says it was God's sovereign choice. God's choice. What kind of God would do that? What kind of God would let you get raped throughout your childhood? I'm not talking about like once or twice, but every day that you can remember as a child, that person came and did that thing that people should not do with children. What kind of God would let you have an abusive husband after you prayed and fasted and was on your face for a godly husband and, and you saw the deacon of the church and, and, and he was good and spoke, but once he gets the alcohol in it, he puts his fist down your throat. What kind of good coach would bring you into a game and you're already 23, 25, 200 points behind? That's the main reason people walk away from the faith. That's the, the argument of the Gnostics and the agnostics and, and Satanists and, and atheists. But how can God be good? And if he is a God, then he's indifferent. He can't be good or bad because look at what he allows. But if I can get deep on you for just a little bit, that very same reason they deny him, is the exact same reason people come to Christ. You, you see, everybody wants the miracles. Nobody wants affliction for 30 years or 400 years. Everybody wants a healing. Nobody wants to be blind. Everybody wants the resurrected, victorious, exceedingly abundantly beyond all I can ask a thing seated at the right hand of God, majesty, but no one wants to die. That's because these are two sides of the same coin. And when you understand that, you realize this man was blessed from birth. Let me help you with that. How many individuals were mentioned in the Bible? Individuals, not armies of 300,000 and sand of the sea and all that, but people either specifically named or specifically tied to an event like the woman at the well or the widow, Zarephath. How many fewer are there specifically because of receiving a miraculous touch from the Messiah's hand. Of all the billions upon billions of people that have existed from the first man until now, he's part of a handful, a select group of people recorded that we will talk about 2,000 years, how Lord knows how many more years he got. 
He's been talking about this man for 2,000 years. Oh, I, I hear you preaching, but you gotta be crazy to call the man blessed before the miracle happens. But try to understand, when you understand the key in verse three, you realize that's exactly what he was. For the sole purpose, you were crafted for the sole purpose of God displaying his power in you. You were solely made with that specific defect, that specific shortcoming, that specific handicap, that specific thing that you struggle with, that specific thing that you don't like about yourself, that specific thing that other people don't like about you, that specific thing that you wish you could change if you could change anything about yourself, that thing were made specifically with that to show that God is stronger than that. And not just for you to get it, but for all the people that pass by that know that you've been that way since you was a kid. Oh, they was just born like that. It's just, that's the way they are. So that they can see too that there's a God in heaven and there's no sickness, no disease, no power, no condition, no place where his hand cannot reach and touch and do all that he pleases. Psalm 193, if you need a reference for that statement. If you do a little bit of thinking, you'll realize that even right now, wherever you are in life, you and that blind man have something in common. Isaiah 64 and 6 says, we are all as an unclean thing. And if I can borrow the words that I heard from a female pastor in Texas, says, all means all, and that's all, all means. She said it just like that too. All means all, and that's all, all means. In Isaiah, the word tells us that we are all as an unclean thing. We won't go into detail as to what that unclean thing is, but it's unclean. That thing is unclean indeed. So, so maybe you weren't born physically blind, but you were born spiritually dead. That's what the Bible says in Isaiah 64 and six. You need another witness? There is none righteous. No, not one, it says it in Psalms and Romans. It's so nice, the Bible says it twice. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of, I could go on for, for days on this specific verse of our ineptitude before the Most High. We've talked about this before. Even if you've been reborn in the spirit through the blood of Christ, there is a process of manifesting that which is spiritual into the physical realm. It is the laws of God. There's a process of manifestation and that process is a lifelong process of manifestation. Long story, long story short, we won't re-preach that whole series to get people to understand that. We're all that blind man in some capacity today. We all need the touch from the master to perform some, some miraculous work in our lives that we can't change that thing about us on our own. We can't take our hand away from that thing on our own. We can't go up that mountain or go that extra mile or do that extra thing. I can't stay on this cross one minute longer. I need you, Jesus, to do X. And it's not give me a new house, new car, new promotion, new job, new vacation. This requires a constant state of repentance and humility before the Most High. I've said this before and I'll say it again. We must constantly, perpetually be mindful of our insufficiency before the Most High. Yeah, we run before him like Abba, Daddy. Yeah, he loves us with an everlasting love. But when you look at him, one of the chief thoughts in your mind should be how big he is and how incredibly small you are. How perfect he is and how incredibly imperfect you are. 
not just how perfect he is and I forget about everything else. No, you remember that law of liberty and you remember looking in the glass what condition you are in. Remember your sickness, your disease, your need for him. In Matthew chapter 9, we have a, an interesting story, not story, an interesting account that that supports that statement. See, Jesus was, uh, you know, doing like humans do, he was going to eat. And he sits down and surrounds himself with the miscreants of society. People who take advantage of others to get ahead. The people who rob and steal, murder, prostitute themselves. The people who lie, cheat. He sits around all of those people and he didn't invite them. But the Bible says they were there, the Pharisees and the scribes, the, the church folk of that day. And they were seeing him and they were watching him and they weren't concerned about how he was changing these people's lives and how they were becoming followers of Christ and how they were interested about the kingdom of God for once in their life when their whole life they've hated the people of God because those are the people who judged them. Now they're interested in God's kingdom. And the, the church people of the day weren't interested in any of that potential. Instead, they said, this man eats with sinners, Republicans. And Jesus turns and he says something that I want us to remember today. It is not the well that need a physician, but the sick. And then he goes on a little bit later and says, he has not come to call the righteous, comma, but sinners to repentance. Now, we know that these Pharisees were the sickest of everybody there because Christ himself, that same Christ that was sitting there eating with the publican, he has some woes for them. He tells them later, he calls them blind guides, hypocrites, not full of sickness, but full of death, dead men's bones. So we see this mystery unfold. The Pharisees, the, the, the most righteous of society, at the time. Isn't it strange by biblical concepts that we live in a world where Christianity seeks to show how clean and pretty and wrapped up it is on the outside and the Messiah that we serve is only seen reaching out to the poor, the needy, the downcast, the downtrodden. The people who have it all, the people who look like they got it all together, the people who, who are clean and shiny on the outside, they got to sneak to him by night because they don't want their friends to know that they're talking to that man. Isn't that opposite? Current today, Christianity says you'll get sinner's cooties. Live your best life now. Jesus' Christianity says die. That's big difference. So we see a mystery unfolding in scripture. Being truly righteous, not Pharisee righteous, being truly righteous by the covering of Christ requires you to acknowledge you are not righteous because everybody was sick. We're all as an unclean thing. We all need Jesus. But he don't come to the people who say, nah, I'm right, I got it. Oh, you got it? Okay, I'll see you in judgment then. You, you must have that good case that, that no one else on earth has, that you can stand before me and say that you's clean in front of my sight, who see everything, that hear every thought, can count the number of heartbeats and hairs on your head at any given moment in your life, that you have been perfect before me. I wanna hear that story. He'll leave you alone and let you tell that story, and then he'll show you how you're a liar. It's the people who come before him and don't even dare to look up at the majesty of his face because they know how dirty that they are, but they beat their chest in sorrow, asking for nothing more than mercy. 
because they know how dirty they are in the presence of a perfect and undefiled God. Being righteous by the covering of Christ requires you to acknowledge that you are not righteous. That in your flesh dwells no good thing. As Paul said that, we're gonna look at that in a little bit. Let me break that down. The, in the physical manifestation of who you are, that's what the flesh is. In the physical manifestation of who you are, there is nothing good about you. You can't make yourself look good in this realm. You can only obey God and let God look good through a busted up vessel. Being holy before God requires you to acknowledge that the sin washed white as snow by the blood does not stop manifesting in the physical realm after you give your life to Christ. If you have any other resolve about your holiness, then you are either a Pharisee or you're on your way to becoming one. Because I guarantee you, the moment you say yes to Christ, even though you are seated in heavenly places and you rule and reign with him in the spirit, like I said before, there's a process of manifestation and that process is lifelong. And growth requires you to be mindful of your need for it. I'll say that again because it's important. Spiritual growth requires you to be mindful of the need for it. The moment you say, I'm so glad Jesus rescued me, his boat runs out of gas for you. Y'all ain't going nowhere else until you say, Jesus, I need you to save me. No, then I'll start up the boat again. But the moment you get to a place of I've been saved so many years and I don't do what I used to do. I'm just so glad. His boat stops running for you. But the moment you continue to testify, God is working on me and look what he's done for me lately. Not, I, I'm, 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 not where I'm, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm so glad I ain't where I used to be. No, I'm not what I used to be and what I was yesterday, I'm not that either. And this is the testimony. This is the Ebenezer stone. This is the manifestation that I died a little bit more to me and I'm living a little bit more for Christ. Not so that you can say, yay me and pat me on the back, but so that you can say, if that person can do it, maybe I can do it too. That's the reason you were born blind. That's the reason you went through that hard time in your life that you were raped, that you were beat up every day, that you were robbed, that you were almost killed, that you lost the use of your legs, that you were when you insert the, the problem that you had to overcome or that you're trying to overcome. You have that burden because you need to testify through God's moving in your life that when you yield to him, that he is able to heal every hurt and take away every scar and fix every problem so that the other person that comes behind you can look at you and say there is a God who can work for me. That's what you do the good works for. That's what the, the being made over in the image of Christ manifesting in this realm is supposed to do that they may see your good works and glorify your father. We talked about that word father before and what that means as far as love. Your father who is in heaven, you become a son when your works glorify the Father. I won't go down that rabbit hole. I think Paul explains what I'm trying to get to you best in his letter to the Romans, uh, chapter seven. So let's, let's go there. Um, and for those of you who have read my book, whether you rightly paid for it or you stole it, that's between you and the Most High. But the book will bless you either way. Even the Bible says stolen waters are sweet. Now, there's a price for it. There's a price you got to pay for it on the back end because you didn't pay on the front end, but it's sweet nonetheless. So I'm going to read a bit out of the book that God gave me to, wrote, to write and know that this might not be the way I would explain it today 
because I've grown so much since this season in this book. But I believe that what God used me to express on paper at that time would really help us um, with understanding this, this passage that we're about to read out of the Bible. So let's go to Romans chapter 7. We're going to start reading at verse 18. Romans chapter 7. Verse 18. And while you're turning there, I'm going to pull up the uh, the, the word, the book that the Lord is uh Lord gave and prepare to read that because I believe it's going to say something that will help us to understand uh, a lot of times that uh, this what we're about to read is uh, misunderstood so let's let's try to understand it a little bit better Okay, we have Romans chapter 7. Okay, start reading that voice, verse. Start reading at verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, in my physical manifestation, the spirit of that physical manifestation, the one that desires that physical manifestation, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. That law. That law. To will, to they law, or to make the right decision, to have the right mind, to have the right intention is present with me. I have the right intention. I have this desire to do this, but how do I get from the desire? to the physical manifestation, how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, in the physical suit that I, I'm, I'm occupying right now. I, I see something going on in my city and it's warring against the law of my intention, the one who rules the city. There's a fight going on in my city and bring me and bringing me into the captivity of the law of sin which is in my members oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death there's an insurrection going on in my city a perpetual war between two forces and I know what side of the force that I'm on but I still don't see a stop to the war who's going to save my city I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's your Savior. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the remainder of that city that's insurrected, the law of sin. Because it's going to be put down, taken off, put to the side one day, and returned to the dirt. Let's, uh, let's keep that in mind. And I'm going to read this excerpt. The flesh and everything of the flesh leads to sin. That is disobeying the will of God for your own will in any given moment. For the spirit which desires to obey the will of God, for it is God in man, is present but doing the things of the spirit is not a consistent thing with man because we are not perfect. 
we were given the ability to make choices and our tendency to sin many times outweighs our tendency to obey God. In the war between the flesh and the spirit, which only exists in the children of God who have been born of the spirit and flesh, i.e. born again, our souls desire to manifest the will of God, but our bodies often end up doing the works of the flesh, eating, sleeping, drinking, being merry. Read the revelation from verse 17 again. This is important. When we become convinced that a thing which has been declared wrong by God is right, i.e. believe a lie, it is no longer the full man or woman that condones the act, but the flesh, sin, within him or her which deceives him or her to act and brings judgment upon the whole being, spirit, soul, and flesh. Yet, when we are born again, our identity is found in the spirit through Christ so that we are no longer beings of the flesh, i.e. found guilty, but of the spirit, meaning we are not found guilty. So as we are transformed from fleshly creatures to spiritual creatures, presently trapped in a fleshly vessel, we find that our desires of holiness our spiritual desires will always be ever present in tandem with desires of evil, fleshly desires in this realm. For while we are born again of the spirit, we are still inside of an earthen vessel that has the same tendencies it has always had. The reborn us, the soul married to the spirit through Christ, delights after the things of God. But the elements to make the old us, the ex-husband of the previous marriage of our soul to our flesh, is still in the same man and can cause us to relapse into the tendencies of the old life. It is a lamentable thing to know the newness of life with Christ, yet not be able to immediately depart from the carnality that caused your separation from him in the first place. The mind is an integral part of the soul. And Paul is not saying that he still carelessly does the same things he's always been doing, but rather that he is completely sold out to Christ and married to the spirit. Yet, yet the desires and the lusts of the flesh are still just as present with him as before, though he now fights against them. Here's your homework today to meditate on, to write down, and submit in the proper format. What things do you struggle with and how are you warring? Not just what things are you struggling with. What are you struggling with and how are you fighting them? What is your current defense? And is it working? What things do you struggle with within yourself? What things do you struggle with in the camaraderie of a fellowship? Are you clinging steadfastly to self-help books and drug releasing patches, drug releasing patches? It is a given that until the day we leave this earth, we will struggle with some part of our carnality. And the, the manner in which we do it, the way that we war, is the deciding factor as to whether or not we will achieve victory. And we know that there's only one way. How often do you pray about your struggles? And do you listen to what you are told after you pray? Do you even have the ability to hear? Do you look for God's response after you pray? Because if not, you're not praying in faith. When he challenges you to action, do you do it? Do you fight the good fight? Or do you hear and ignore? That's how you turn his voice down and make it hard for you to hear him the next time because he won't just keep speaking into deaf ears. He'll leave you alone and let you have a seared conscience and receive the fullness of your sin. Fight the good fight this season. Let us be alert as to the things God is showing us and the steps placed in front of us by the deliverer of our souls from the body of this death. I'm 
will say that again for the homework's sake. What things do you struggle with? And how are you worrying? What things do you struggle with? And how are you worrying? What things do you struggle with and how are you worrying within yourself? What things do you struggle with and how are you worrying in the camaraderie of a fellowship? Are you clinging steadfastly to worldly solutions, self-help books, drug releasing patches, the 12 step program? Are you clinging steadfastly to that or are you praying, listening, and looking for God's response? Are you praying with expectancy that he will respond and then have your eyes open for that response? Because the word says that he do not tempt us beyond measure, but he does, he, uh, he does, the word says that he does not put more on us than we can bear, but with every temptation will provide a way of escape. So are you looking for that way? When he challenges you to the action required to follow that way, do you do it? That's your homework for this week. Trust me, it'll bless you. If you do your homework, it'll bless you. This period, not, not just this one for this week. Every homework that the Lord asks me to give to you, it will bless your soul if you do it. Even if you don't turn it in. It'll bless you. So I pray that you are blessed. I pray that this word has been good seed on good soil. I pray that every person who is designed to receive this word does so and responds with the proper response. That you, God, would touch the hearts and minds of all of your children and cause them to assume the posture of repentance and humility before you such that they might receive the good word that would cause more fruitfulness in their lives. Not fruitfulness of the world's God, but fruitfulness of you, Most High. I pray that you would continue to lead and guide us according to your righteous right hand, and that you would be glorified as you don't give us the information that is meaningless but the information that is so critical and pertinent in these times that we are entering into. Because I thank you, God, that you don't just give us head knowledge. You don't just give us things that will satisfy our conscience, but you speak to us that we might be led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, that we might be able to walk through the waters that surround on high everywhere we go on dry ground and cause the elements to forget their nature because you are God alone, oh Lord. So I just pray your will be done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.